Well, it is now 3.30 and 30 seconds. So um, I think we are going to get started. We I'm sure are going to use the entire hour and I'm going to speak very little here. I think many of you have probably done a little bit of uh, online uh, looking at, uh, at uh, Brad and Brian's uh, website, uh, Two Blind Brothers. So I'm uh, not going to take any time at all uh, doing that. Remember that if you uh, would like to ask questions or pose a question on the chat, please go ahead and do that. I'd ask that you put your hand up if you're going to ask a question using the microphone and then just uh, fire the question into the chat. I'll be managing that for Brad and uh, and Brian and uh, and then we're going to be uh, rocking and rolling here. So uh, <laughs> the Brad and uh, Brian, welcome, uh, gentlemen. Uh, you're unmuted, and I'm turning it over to you. We are just thrilled uh, here in Alberta to uh, to be grabbing an hour of uh, what I'm sure is very very busy time for the both of you. So thanks for providing that for us, and take it away. No problem. Hello to our new Alberta, Canada family. Yeah, we're uh, we're so happy that you guys were uh, we're so thrilled to be invited and so honored to be able to speak to all of you today. Uh, it's a little bit of a you know, it's a little bit of an odd format through a video cast, but we're going to make the absolute best of it. The only thing we ask is we really are here as a, uh, we're going to tell our story a good bit, especially focusing, you know, on going to school and being a little younger and then talk about our business to Blind Brothers a little bit. But what we'd really, really love and appreciate is if all of you out there would, uh, be willing to ask questions if there's anything that you uh, you are wondering. Brad and I have been visually impaired now for 25, 30 years, and so we're uh, we're we're a plethora of mostly useful knowledge. There is some useless stuff up there as well. And frankly, the questions are nice too because everyone outside the door just thinks Brian and I are having an awkwardly loud conversation <laughs> with each other. Um, but to sort of start this off, and you know, we have sort of an outline of things that we want to go over. But you know, the main topics we wanted to talk about is first of all, you know, who we are, our, our experience with vision impairment, and then, and then as Brian mentioned, our story. Um, so maybe to kick it off, I'll just mention, you know, that Brian and I are brothers. I know I'm way better looking than him. It's hard <laughs> to believe, uh, but basically, at the age of five, I'm five years older than Brian. I started having symptoms um, of an eye issue in my center of vision. I failed the kindergarten eye chart. And it started this year and a half long hunt uh, through doctor's offices, through lots of questions to try to figure out what had happened to my eyesight. And it ended me up in a doctor's office with my mom. And, you know, some of you will relate to this experience. Um, but, you know, the doctor walked in after doing a bunch of tests and said that I had a disease called Stargardt's disease. Um, and if you don't know Stargardt's, it's a form of macular degeneration. Um, it's mo most common in a lot of folks' grandparents. We just have sort of a, uh, a rare and juvenile form of it. And you know the effect on the vision is that it really kind of destroys your center vision. Most of the time with Stargardt's, but not always, you keep your peripheral vision. Brian and I have decent peripheral vision and you know, when that moment happened, um, it was incredibly shocking for our parents. Um, you know, for me as a five-year-old or a seven-year-old at that time, I didn't have context on what that meant. You know, I didn't know how it would affect my life. I'd never met anyone with a vision impairment. Um, but, you know, my our mom, you know, shrunk in the corner a little bit because she knew that this was going to be an obstacle and what she had pictured, um, you know, what our challenges would be without eyesight obviously was a big moment of concern for her knowing that she was going to have a son that was visually impaired. And mom, you know, and the way she tells this story is, I'm sure what's happened to a lot of you is that she projected for the rest of our lives, all of the things that we wouldn't be able to do, oh my God, they're not gonna be able to drive a date to prom. They're not gonna be able to try. I mean, just getting a date was a challenge for me, but at least the, the driving piece was not the hard. 
you know, but or they're not going to be able to play regular sports or they're going to be picked on in school. She was projecting so far in the future for two or three weeks. And then, you know, we asked her recently about it and she actually said that, you know, it took her three weeks and then she noticed that Brad was the same kid that he hadn't changed his outlook on the world was the exact same. He was still just a seven year old kid trying to figure out life and being the same seven year old kid. And all that had changed was her perception of him. And that if, if she, that her new mission was to not allow visual impairment to dictate our lives, it was always going to be another hurdle in our life that it was going to be a challenge that we always had to overcome but it was one of many and the way she would phrase that to us was to say that you know brian you maybe are you maybe have worse eyes than the other kids in school but you might be a little bit taller or you might be a little faster or you might be a little smarter or you might have better hearing i don't know if any of them are true but they were great to hear as a little kid to boost the ego up but that was but that was her big philosophy that if you are this is just one thing you're dealing with and and it's going to help you in the future to be able to take on bigger and badder problems and we've really really tried to adopt that yeah and you know one of the things we wanted to talk about is like what what that was like in us for school you know Brian and I have been really lucky to have uh great people around us resources we we've, we've been fortunate to get a good education um, but certainly there was a lot of confusion in those early years about how we would tackle school because I think there's some very unique challenges, maybe even more so in school than there are once you kind of realize what your strengths are and choose careers that cater to that strength. So, you know, one of the first times that I remember having trouble in school was in first grade where, you know, kindergarten, we didn't have a blackboard. And in our first grade, we had a, we had a blackboard. And my mom, you know, made me promise her that if I couldn't see something on the board, I would get up out of my seat and walk to the board to go see it. And that, along with a litany of other tests and trials was sort of how we originally um, atta attacked school because there was, there was no guideline. I mean, we had some people around us that could give us some, but, you know, eye diseases can be very rare and very different. And so it started this trial and error process of trying to figure out what worked for us. For examples of things that we tested were, you know, which seat in the classroom let us see the board the best so that we didn't get glare on the chalkboard. How big did the teacher have to write in the classroom? You know, could we talk to the teacher about making sure that she was, you know, um, speaking through the note that she was writing? Um, could she use a, a, a different color chalk that made it easier for us to see? And, you know, some of these were things that were useful these were things that we tried but you know I think early on before we even knew it we realized that the spirit of trying things to figure out what worked was really the most important part and you know and just to finish that story you know I remember that first day in first grade going up to that board and you know I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this one of the first times in my life that I felt very different because none of the other kids had to get up out of their seat. So I remember walking to the front of that board, turning around and feeling all the eyes of the other students on me and being very confused about, about that feeling. And then, you know, certainly what starts soon after that is kids coming up to you and saying, can you see or how many fingers am I holding up? And, um, you know, that was a moment that, you know, made me feel very, uh, different. Um, you know, obviously, as a side note, and probably a lot of people watching this know, uh, the answer to how many fingers am I holding up is always two. <laughs> uh, for some reason, that's what everybody does. Um, but we just started to realize that, that we needed to uh, try things, tweak things, make iterations. And then it also started this series of little challenges and little moments that over time would build your problem solving and resilience skills. 
And it's it's interesting because when Brad and I went to school, you know, especially elementary and middle school years and years ago, the technology was so much further back. I mean, I had a pocket magnifier and large print textbooks, like audiobooks were not even decent back then. They were still on cassette cassette tapes and none of my textbooks were digital and anything so you know even today it seems like there's been such a technological boom that's allowed the playing field to get leveled with you know smart boards and projecting to ipads that you can hold close a lot of textbooks being on computers where you can zoom in or use screen readers or even you know some of the new eyewear uh glasses and things that allow the technology for you to you know bring the board closer to you and a lot of it actually simply just came down to determination to do the work i mean in fourth grade it wasn't the determination wasn't 100 percent there but you know the technology now allows brad and i to run a business that we otherwise probably wouldn't have been able to if it was large print books and magnifiers, you know, 10 years ago. And, you know, not to cut Brian off, um, as I do often throughout the day. <laughs> um, but, you know, so that I would say that that really categorized our elementary school experience was trial and error, uh, a few awkward situations here and there, trying to navigate sort of the practical issues as it relates to vision impairment. Um, now, if I, if I were to think about sort of middle school. Pause there, see if there's any questions. Oh, sh sure. I don't yeah. know if there are. I just, are there any questions, Rory? I just want to make sure that they're, that we're not steamrolling anything. I was thinking. Right yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing okay. hands up and nothing has come in on the, uh, on the chat. But one thing does occur to me, uh, guys and uh, Brad, it's uh, from what you were, uh, you were talking about, that point at which kids, realized in elementary school that you in fact had a visual impairment and you know we're doing all of the the grade four type things like that you referred to what did you guys do to sort of mitigate that to sort of maintain your social uh track you know in in those early elementary years that's a great question because that's the next that's actually uh exactly what i was going to mention next which was you know after elementary school came sort of middle school and high school a and that point that you bring up i would say it was really the crux of uh the challenge for that age because at that age that's what you care about you know you care about your social standing you know you care about uh you know bullies and teasing and, and fitting in and it is definitely a bumpy process, but I think that we learned some very, very important lessons. And, you know, and, I, and we'll talk a little bit through those. The first thing, the, the, the first thing that happened to, to me, and I, and I think, and Brian will share his thoughts as well, is, you know, when kids start to, uh, start to tease each other more, or they try to socially isolate somebody, they will find the thing that is just obviously different about you. You know, Kevin has big ears. Sorry, Kevin. Uh, you know, uh, you know, this person is short. This person, you know, is overweight. And for Brad and Brian, it was, you know, Brad and Brian can't see. You know, and when that happened, it's one, really confusing, and two, you know, very emotional. You don't have uh, insight as to, as to how to deal with that. So I'll tell you what, what sort of happened for us. When I first started getting teased in middle school or in high school, I got, I felt isolated and I felt sad. You know, I felt it was unfair. I attributed a, the, the teasing to something that was wrong with me, which was my eyesight. I felt different. Um, and that was the case for a little while. And then, sh and then sh that sort of morphed into a different emotion. At some point, I started to get angry about it. Somebody might tease me about my eyesight, and this is probably kind of maybe closer to high school. Somebody might say something to try to take a dig at me. And I wanted to sort of attack them back. And 
you know, and, and, and that you, you, you try out that idea for, or I tried out that idea for a little bit. But I think what we inevitably realize is that the person who is making that insult or taking that position is it's really more about them. A lot of the teasing and the bullying that goes on, it's so, you know, they could have fixed my eyesight 100% and these same people would have found something else to say. There's a lot to say about him, <laughs> just so you're aware. But we so, but basically that's just to say that the, the thing that deflates that energy the fastest is non-reaction, non-reactivity. You know, when somebody says something to try to hurt you, they're trying to get a reaction out of you. You know, take, take, who, take your favorite celebrity, the coolest person in the entire world. You know, if I went up to Barack, uh, you know, Barack Obama, Richard Branson, you know, not to be political, we could pick Donald Trump, we could pick uh, Justin Trudeau, and I said anything to them in the nature of anything that any bully had said to them, hey, you have big ears, hey, you're short, you're tall, you're fat, they, it's not even going to hit them. They are, it's, it's going to be water off their shoulders, they're going to look at you funny, laugh, and move on with their day. And I think as Brian and I learned that really, it's not about you, it's about them, that's the way that we approach those issues. Yeah, yeah. And one story that kind of highlights this is uh, when I first got to high school, I went to a different high school than middle school. And not many people there knew me. So I, I didn't want to be the blind kid anymore. I was just really tired of it. And so my first day, I just, you know, I went to class and I sat in the back of the room and I just tried to keep my head down because I thought I could just fake it and maybe I would figure out later on what to do about how to learn in school when I couldn't see the board, but I just didn't want for a day to be the blind kid. And that first day in my first class, my, it was a physics class and my physics teacher just calls on me and says, Brian, can you do the problems on the board? And I said, sure. Yeah. What, what problem? Just because I built these strategies to not have to always be getting up, not have to always be, telling everybody that I was visually impaired. I was, I was embarrassed by it. And I kept saying, oh, what problem? You know, uh, what, what numbers? Is it uh, multiplication division? Like, which, which thing? And eventually he's like, hey, stop playing dumb. It's division. Just do it. And I kind of ran out of excuses. I ran out of things to say to try and trick the world. And so I had to admit, which was terrible. I do admit that I couldn't do it because I couldn't see it because I was legally blind. And instead of owning my visual impairment, I now signaled to every single person in that room, to my teacher, and most importantly to myself, that this was something that was meant to be embarrassing, that I, that I was embarrassed. So you should act odd about it as well. And it, but as sad as that moment was for me, it was actually an unbelievably good thing because I realized that nothing ever could be worse than that situation. Nothing could ever hurt more than sitting right there. And so I thought hiding it has caused all the pain. Well, what's the opposite of that is just being super open about it and being lighthearted about it and just be saying that this is something that I'm diagnosed with. And if that changes somebody's opinion of me, then whatever, I don't care. This is, this is who I am and this is who I'm going to be, so I might as well own it. And that's a really hard realization to make. And it's even harder to put into practice. And it took me probably, you know, I'm still working on it today, but it took me a few years to really master it. But to my best piece of advice to anybody out there who's visually impaired or has a, a loved one who's visually impaired is that is just that. It's not going to change. Eventually it will because the science is amazing. So there's always hope, but it's not going to change tomorrow. So the best solution that you have is to accept it, make it a part of who you are, and then move forward and be grateful for it in some ways because 
that's the best possible way to deal with it. And that took me all of high school to, to come up with and, and to work through. And it was a really, and there was a lot of bumps in the road and I still got angry at people who called me blind. I still got sad about it. I still got hurt by it. But every time it happened, it was a little bit less because I was like, yeah, whatever. So what I am. And that was a, a big revealing moment for me. <clears throat> Great answer to the question that I posed earlier, guys. Fabulous. Thank you. And, and you know, I, basically, I think one of the things that's just going on right now in the world that we live in is as technology improves, as, you know, as there are increasing numbers of opportunities for the types of li lives you can live and jobs you can have. And, you know, we, we've gotten to know like someone like Molly Burke extremely well, who's a, a, a blind YouTuber. Um, and, you know, you're just fascinated by the opportunities that exist in the world. Um, and, and more and more and more, the big risk to something like a vision impairment is that somebody doesn't feel uh, their full sense of self-worth or their full potential or their or their full sense of self-esteem, you know? So, you know, it, it, and it may, you, somebody like, you know, it, it's funny, people will have different views on this. This is just Brian's and I's particular path that we took. But, you know, what we encourage is basically make sure you are putting yourself out there in front of those challenges over and over again, because over time, even if you're as dumb as Brian and I, <laughs> you will figure out what your lane, you will find your, your solution. Um, you will find what resonates true for you. Um, and, and that's how we approached uh, middle school and high school and learned some of those lessons. And then, you know, Brian and I both applied and, and went to you know college at the University of Virginia and and, you know, a lot of, and the, the kind of big piece of advice from that period in our lives is, is still trying to achieve, and I, I, maybe I'll go back for a second, you know, one thing, one question we usually get about, you know, middle school, high school, it, about, especially about kids that age is should they play sports or should they be, should the parents put them into that harder class or whatever. And our philosophy always, and this comes down from our parents, is to give it a try. If it isn't going to immediately hurt you, like our parents, you know, weren't really pumped on us becoming professional skydivers or, or airplane pilots. But, you know, when I said I wanted to play football or lacrosse or Brad wanted to swim, we were a, we were encouraged to try it. You know, we maybe were not going to be the best player on the team. We maybe were not going to have the strongest academic performance in that class, but what you come to find is the amount of things you think you'll fail at and the amount of things you actually fail at are, are a lot, the amount of things you think you're gonna fail at is a lot smaller than, you would, than you'd suspect originally. And what that did for us is it grew our confidence. It said, wow, I didn't think I would actually be good at this. Oh, I am. Maybe there's something else that I don't think I'm gonna be good at that I actually might be. I better go try to see if I can. And if I fail, whatever cool i realized i was bad at it i already thought that so now let me go on to the next thing and that was a big boon of confidence for us and that kind of carried over into uh, our college years and the only big piece of it, piece of the thought there is you know a lot of major institutions you know our college you know a workplace you know schools in general have a lot of assistance and sometimes people feel that it's a little tough to ask for help when they need it and that's something that we were, we became, we like to think experts at that is realizing where we were deficient, realizing where we had a problem and ask and trying to come up with a solution and then asking for help to get that solution rather than just trying to gut your way through every single thing. It's really beneficial to say, Hey, I need extra time on tests. Okay. You qualify. Now I get time and a half. That's fantastic. Hey, I, uh, you know, it'd be great if I could have, you know, the notes given to me by the professor. I can't see the board. Yeah, no problem. Now I don't even need to go to class. That was the best <laughs> part. No, but that's the, but that piece, those asking for help moments are crucial and were some of the best things we ever did. You know, and I'll just wrap it up with sort of what we think are like three really great takeaways as it relates to school and, and growing up with a vision impairment. 
one trial and error, right? There's gonna be solutions and new solutions coming out every day that make you more effective um, and trying them and experimenting with new ideas. I mean, it took me a long time to move from, to, to start using like text to speech and it's incredibly valuable. It was actually a friend who is cited uh, perfectly cited that used it, that, that made me actually use it because I didn't grow up with it. It took me a long time to be willing to experiment with it. But trial and error, find the tools and the styles and the formats for, of things that work really well for you. Number two, um, leverage your resources. There are people, there are, uh, you know, th there's uh, resources set aside in school and your, in your government. Um, and, and, and basically take advantage of them to the fullest extent possible. They're there, they will help you. It's gonna give you in certain circumstances, like when we could get like two times, uh, you know, uh, two, uh, twice the extra time on tests. You know, sometimes that was actually, you know, more than we needed and actually helped us, you know? And, and, and don't be afraid uh, of finding those things and using them because life is about, problem solving and it doesn't matter you know you, you want to make sure you're using all the tools in your tool chest to get there um, you know another big resource for us are other people you know we have no problem all day all the time asking people for help um, and it's not a sign of weakness it's what we use in our business today hey how do we create an email marketing campaign well let's ask someone who's done it really effectively you know all the way down to if we can't see a menu in a restaurant we ask the waiter for the recommendation other people can be in a tremendous resource. So um, trial and error, leverage your resources. And then three, what we touched on, embrace challenges. The fastest way to build up resilience, to find your strengths, is to embrace those things that put you outside of your comfort zone. And just to kind of cap it all together, it, this is because we think education is so critical, especially if you're visually impaired. We saw it ourselves growing up through, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school. It's easy to fall behind in certain settings. You know, I couldn't tell time in third grade or whatever when we learned how to tell time. That was, that was kindergarten. Kindergarten, so I guess. I, I, maybe I was in the delayed program. <laughs> but, you know, when we learned to tell time, I couldn't see what they were doing. And I kind of sat back and chatted with my friends and didn't really worry about it. And it actually, like, it took me like an extra year or two to learn how to do it because I had missed that moment in time, no pun intended, to learn how to do that. And, you know, I, for somebody who's visually impaired, there's unique challenges in school, but you cannot let that be an excuse for sacrificing what you learn um, because that's what you're gonna use for the remainder of your, of your life to make sure that you can get ahead. Um, and I guess we'll pause there for a second before we get into our uh, sort of the story about how we started this business, uh, which is really fun, but I'll, I'll pause there, Roy, if, if you have something to add. Well, a number of things have been certainly running through through my head as you've been uh, been talking. You, you've referenced technology a fair bit. Uh, what kinds of technology are you guys using now or have been using, you know, sort of effectively in the last while? I know you talked about uh, text-to-speech. Uh, anything else? Yeah, I think text to speech, uh, you know, Apple products have kind of become our go to for a lot of this stuff. The Zoom function on the iPhone, Siri is super helpful to do text to speech and speech to text, uh, as well as on our MacBooks, we use a lot of the highlight text to speech and Zoom abilities, which you know, sounds so trivial, but at the end of the day, they are unbelievable. Because I remember, as some of you may, the win the Windows magnifier, the little bar that sat at the top of the computer screen that almost did nothing. And I went through all of high school. I'll never forget, I read my AP economics book with a pocket magnifier word by word because I didn't have a better tool at the time. You know, we've seen some, so we've seen some folks, uh, using you know a bunch of different apps obviously like jaws and screen readers are great or you know the the acrobat readers are another another great tool that i use for most of my college experience but technology has come so far and you know i gotta be honest we haven't kept up with it in the same way because it hasn't been as necessary uh for us from a strictly educational standpoint 
Excellent. Thank you, you very know, much. You, some things that we think. Yeah, no, it, it, we're, it's, it's very, uh, we actually get, you know, approached by a lot of these um, companies that are working on very innovative solutions all the time. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's a little tough in this space is things are so personal and curated, d d depending on, you know, what your level of function is and what your particular preferences are. Um, you know, two things that I think are really fun if you get a chance to experiment with them, I don't know if they're practical for everybody, but just two really fun apps. One is called um, Seeing AI. It's a Microsoft app. It's really fun because you can take a picture of somebody and it'll tell you how old <laughs> it thinks they are. Uh, it can tell you like the scene in front of you, how many people are in front of you. It can read handwriting. It's a, it's a free app. It's called Seeing AI. It's really cool. I also, uh, we have a friend named Suman who started a company called Ira, A-I-R-A dot I-O, and it connects you to a vision orientation specialist through the camera on your phone. So if I wanted to find the exit from a room, I hit my Ira app, it opens up to, uh, uh, to a, um, somebody who's connected to me um, wire, uh, over Wi-Fi tell me where to go. And it's sort of, again, you know, it's not necessary for us because Brian and I still have um, decent mobility, but, uh, but it, it's just fascinating to see these things emerging. Excellent. Thank you very much. I've gotten a couple of questions, guys, in the, uh, in the chat that I'll, uh, I'll pass on to you. One of them um, addresses the uh, teacher of the visually impaired, so the, the specialist professional who comes mm -hmm. into the school to support the classroom teacher. Uh, did you guys, uh, can you talk about those folks? And uh, many of, many of uh, the folks that are on the webinar today are, in fact, teachers of the visually impaired. So maybe just talk about your experience there and uh, any, any words of advice around that. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful woman named Ricky who we're still friends with. She was a absolute angel. Uh, and I think I started seeing her when I was in first or second grade, all the way up through probably sixth grade-ish, sixth or seventh grade. And you know, what we spent a lot of our time with, and it was, we spent a lot of time learning Braille, uh, you know, cause that they weren't sure how far our vision was gonna go. But on the other side, she taught me how to type. Like I was the first kid in my like second grade or third grade class who knew how to type. And she taught me, you know, she, one thing that she did that was always so great is she took cues from my, my parents and took cues from my teachers and took cues from everybody that this visual impairment thing was not to be an excuse. And that was really something special where she was never hard on me, but you know, I, she'd be like, Oh, did you end up doing that homework that you were supposed to? I'd be like, no, I couldn't see the problem. And she goes, I don't know if that's hundred percent true, Brian. I know how well you can see. And I know that you could see that. And then, you know, it just made me be accountable to, you know, different people who weren't necessarily my parent or my teacher. She was really good at being a third party person who was helping me a lot with visual impairment as a, as a technical skill, but also as a life skill that, hey, you know, I know that you can do that. Hey, I think you should go do that. And, you know, she instilled a lot of very good values in that way. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the, the, the few people that we worked with, they really modeled good behavior and, and life skills for us. You know, when we were having an issue that came up in school, they would be an advocate for us mm -hmm. at the school. And then we could see, you know, and that taught us that it was an okay to be an advocate for yourself, you know? So, it, it, you know, it, it felt like, it, it almost at some level felt like a, a, like a bit of a mentorship or just like a warm, a warm person that was felt, they felt like they were on our team. Um, they were empathetic, uh, but they also kind of, um, they also were invested in your, your, your growth and building yourself and problem solving. And um, they, they served a, a, a wonderful role in our lives because we had, we, up, up until that point, we, we hadn't really met many people that empathized mm -hmm. 
with the things that we were struggling with, you know? Um, they were, I mean, our, our parents uh, were great parents and they gave us the right, re, you, you know, and we, and we took our cues from them. Uh, you know, certainly we had good teachers that weren't vision um, uh, orientation specialists, but to sit down with somebody that you knew had met with, you know, dozens if not hundreds of people who have faced a similar challenge to you, as a kid, you know, that person is a, is somebody, whether you like it or not, you really got to look to for, um, for cues because they just by nature of their role have an expertise and a wisdom about what you're going through that you may not have. Mm -hmm. So we were very lucky to have very warm, supportive, um, genuine uh, people who taught us, you know, uh, practical skills as well as advocacy skills as well as held us to a, a standard as well. Awesome. That's, that was great. A great answer. Thank you very much. Uh, something else that sort of came out of that was your vision guys uh, ever to the point where Braille was considered uh, for you in school? No. So Brad and I learned Braille. Uh, we got grade one and we got grade two. And then, uh, and then, you know, they kind of realized their vision had, had plateaued. So we, I didn't continue to learn it. I mean, I still, we still have it, but not grade two. That is tricky stuff. Uh, <laughs> but I would say that, no, we never used Braille in school as a learning device. Awesome. And Thank you. Yeah, and, and the reason, but just to clarify, the reason we learned it is because we have a degenerative disease. So they weren't sure how quickly uh, or dramatic the vision loss would be. Um, so that's, that's what sort of inspired us learning it at that age. Great, great. Uh, and then another question that came up, and this one is a really poignant one for, uh, for teenagers who are seeing all of their friends moving in on the driving world. And uh, knowing that uh, you probably were never going to get your driver's licenses, any any words of wisdom uh, around, you know, working with those kids? Yeah, it's actually I, it's actually one word, uh, Uber. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. They you you know they drive for you. You don't even need to bother with it at this point. Uh, you know, our, our it, it's funny. That's always everyone's biggest concern. And if you talk to anybody under the age of 15, their biggest concern is always getting their license if they're visually impaired or not. But I think if you talk to anybody over the age of 17 or 18, they don't really care about having their license. And, if you, and most visually impaired people who didn't get their license and are 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, don't really miss driving. I mean, I, we, I, we've spoken to a lot of people who think, oh yeah, that'd be nice, but you find friends who are willing to be your driver. You now have Uber and Lyft and all those apps that get somebody for you when your friends can't. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing in that moment, but once you, I don't know, once it's, once you're already past that point, it feels less important. Yeah, I would add that. Um, I would add that. Yes, it it sucks, right? You, everyone is getting to do this cool thing that you might be limited to do. Uh, the way that you know we kind of dealt with that is one. Uh, we had a lot of friends who could drive, um, and, and and frankly, you know, it was something that we tried our best to to turn into a situation where it became less and less of an issue. You know, uh, when we went on to college, uh, you know, I, we didn't really have to drive anywhere in college. We were on a campus that was very accessible. When we were kind of finding, deciding where we wanted to live after college, we both moved to big cities, you know, where public transportation helped us out. It's, it, it, and truthfully, the kind of amazing thing is that nobody is going to be driving. Like, when <laughs> 15, 20 years. I mean, that is, that, I mean, it, it, it's amazing how quick technology is moving. And, you know, you know, it's not the best answer. There's no magic fix to it. Um, I would just say uh, the practical advice is find friends who can drive, you know, maybe uh, 
argue with Uber to try to get free credit <laughs> uh, in, in your city <laughs> or, um, or, or and, and put yourself in situations where driving becomes less and less of an issue um, to the extent you know that that you can I, I mean and other than that you know we, we certainly were disappointed that we were, were, weren't able to maintain our license but that that's how we dealt with it great Great answers. Thank you, guys. And we'll take one more question. I'm not even sure, based on when you finished school, if this is going to be something that uh, that you're going to be able to offer any advice on, but I'll throw it out there anyway. And this will be the last one before we move on to talking about uh, about the uh, business. Uh, and that's from a, from a teacher who works in an online environment. Any tips for students uh, who have a visual impairment who are taking online courses? So I'm not sure if that was a thing when you guys were uh, in school or not. Give them all A's. I think that's really the best thing you could do. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that's really the answer. No, uh, I didn't. I, 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 all my classes were kind of in person. Uh, but I, truthfully, it should be easier. Tr truth, truthfully, you know, there should be some big advantages there. I mean, in, in the sense that depending on the platform, I know sometimes there's weird, you know, there's weird things on these platforms, but ideally, you're teaching on a platform where somebody can use their text to speech program really well. What's great is that, you know, they can record the audio. Uh, I, I, I mean, that'd be helpful for anybody. I mean, the, the lecture by nature of the fact that it's, um, that it's, uh, um, you know, on audio, it's going to be easy for them to hear. It might be easier for them to play back. Certainly I can imagine a situation where it's like a math class and you're trying to demo something, you know, on, uh, on a presentation or on sort of some sort of live stream. That's tough. You know, some of the, that would be tough in person. Yeah, it would be, it would be tough in person. You know, it, it, what we always tried to do, what we tried to do and this, this really applies to a situation where you're, and this was really true in math classes, at least for me, is, is it was really hard to follow what was being done on the board. Uh, I always had to either meet with the teacher 10 minutes or 15 minutes either before the class or after the class so they could contextualize the lesson. Or if they could, they would give me some sort of handout that was large print or, print or blown up. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably going to be somewhat platform for sp specific and subject specific. Um, but certainly, uh, what what's awesome if you're low vision is that it allows you to sort of zoom in um, to see people. I mean, I can zoom in on like Roy's face when he has his camera on uh, easier than I could if he was see it easier than if he was right here in person. Um, I, that might not be a, a great specific answer to the question, but that's that's been our experience. No, that was a good answer. Thank you very much. So uh, it's 4.13 now. We, uh, we've got about 17 minutes left. So I think we'll launch into uh, some talk about uh, the uh, Two Blind Brothers brand. Great. Um, so this brand has been the greatest adventure uh, of our lives thus far. And we'll, we'll give you a little bit of background on it. Um, you know, in the Summer of 2015. Oh shoot! I'm I'm sorry. I just gotta take this one second. I'm waiting for this call. Oh yeah. I think I think Brian has a call, and uh, like all younger brothers, he leaves me hanging by myself to do all the work, uh, like he does in our business normally. Um, hopefully, he'll be back in a second. Um, uh, but uh, so basically, the story on Two Blind Brothers is Brian and I were. Um, walking around in New York City one day. I was working at an investment firm. Brian was working in sales uh, for a data company. And we walked into a Bloomingdale's store. And, you know, if you're blind or you're visually impaired, shopping can sometimes be a pain. And, sometimes, and keeping track of people can sometimes be a pain. And on this particular day, Brian and I lost each other in the store I find him a half an hour later outside the store and we had both bought the exact same shirt. And we're like, 
first of all, we played rock, paper, scissors, and he lost. So he had to go return it because you can't wear the same shirt as your brother unless you run a clothing brand and you, we inevitably wear the same shirts all the time. Um, but in that moment, we were, tr- we were kind of laughing about why that was. And, you know, just the way that Brian and I shop is, you know, we'll like kind of like touch all the clothes uh, to see if we like the feel of them. And then we'll do the work to figure out the brand, the price, you know, the size. We'll get the help from the sales associate. And it was that attention to touch that led us to the same shirt. And both him and I just loved these soft Henley three-button shirts. And at that moment, we thought, you know, we, there's no way we could ever, like, leave our careers or, or actually go think about starting a successful clothing brand. It's like one of the – you know, a, a, a clothing company is probably one of the worst businesses you could probably go out and prospectively start. It's just super competitive and, and the margins aren't great. And then because you're a brand, you're constantly fighting for attention. But we had a lot of friends in New York City that worked in the fashion space and they offered to help us work with a manufacturer here in the city to make a few hundred shirts. And the idea would be this would be a fun side project for us and we would sell the shirts to our friends. We'd make a little website. And we are very close with a national organization. Actually, it's in Canada as well. It's called the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And they fund all the research for not just our retinal eye disease, but, but many, many others. Um, we've been close to them since we were young. And we thought this would be 80% it would be a fun project for us to do. And 20% we were doing something good to give back. And it, and it, but it was always meant to be a side project. And then what happened is we had a friend make a video on our story and he did a, he was a Starbucks barista, but he had a passion for doing video. He did a two minute video on our story. And we put it out on Facebook and it went crazy. Um, and then all of a sudden, and this was in May of 2016 when we launched the brand, then we started getting these media inquiries. Uh, we would, you know, the first really cool one was a local news station said that they wanted to come interview us. Brian and I both called in sick to work uh, to do the interview. And that started snowballing up until January of 2017 when we were on the Ellen DeGeneres show. We got a random call from one of their producers on our customer service line. And then after we all fainted and fell on the floor, uh, we did several interviews with them over the course of the month, and that was a huge inflection point for us. So after that, a lot happened. We had the L- support from Ellen, other, uh, NBC Nightly News, which is a big show here in the U.S., covered it. We got some big support from Rick, Richard Branson of you know, Virgin Airlines, Virgin Galactic. Uh, Ashton Kutcher, the actor, um, uh, gave us some support. And our heads are spinning in this moment. But it was at that time that we decided this is such a rare opportunity in life to be given this type of momentum on something that was very personal to us, something that we thought, you know, could make an impact and something that we enjoyed. And that's when we decided to go all in to uh, professionalize the company. We hired a few people. Um, and we've been sort of rocking and rolling um, ever since. Uh, to date, we've been able to donate $300,000 to the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, we've had um, uh, a chance to meet all kinds of amazing people who fa- who, who, who've dealt with blindness and vision impairment even much more successfully than Brian and I have. Um, uh, governor David Patterson, who is the first governor of New York, uh, who is blind, um, uh, Eric Weinmayer, who's climbed every mountain, uh, the tallest mountain on every continent, who's blind. Uh, Molly Burke, the cool uh, young YouTuber, um, and, and just tons and tons of fascinating people. So it's been a really fun adventure. But, the, but the point I want to make about it, though, is that a lot of what helped build that company were the lessons that we learned in school and it just so it, it hits you over the head like a like a sack of potatoes if brian and i never got comfortable being called the blind kid you know by that those, those kids in middle school and high school 
we would have never been comfortable naming our company Two Blind Brothers. If we never had that experience of figuring out in first grade or high school or college how to problem solve and deal with something that didn't have an obvious solution, we wouldn't have been able to tackle some of the issues related to the entrepreneurial problems that come up with any startup. You know, one of the tools that we talk about a lot, I mean, and this is unique to Brian and I, is we can't recognize faces. And one of the skills that that taught us through high school and college and in, and in my dating life in New York City is that you have to, it, it, we've, we've sort of made the decision that if we don't recognize somebody right away, we try to take as much ownership of the conversation as possible. You walk up to me, I don't know if I've met you before, I don't know if you know that I have a vision impairment, you might be an important person and maybe the first conversation I wanna have with you is not telling you all about Stargardt's disease. So, you know, I say, hey, how's it going? What have you been up to? What's new? Oh yeah, how's the holiday season been? Any travel plan? You know, and you just take a lot of ownership and, and, and it's those skills that have helped us do things like, you know, uh, give speeches or, you know, riff off the cuff on a, on a webinar or, you know, chat with the, produ the junior producer on the Ellen DeGeneres show. And, and, and we've just been fascinated by this phenomenon that the obstacles in your life, not all of them, you know, you, no one's, I think it's wrong for somebody to say that like every challenge you're ever given is a good one. But most of the challenges in our lives are the things that unlock our potential because the problem solving and resilience and um, reaction to challenges, it's those mindsets and skills that are so helpful. And for entrepreneurship, it's the, the, those are the critical skills. So that, that's the story of Two Blind Brothers and how it relates to our experience coming up as, as students. Fabulous. I have one question. The, uh, the, the first uh, uh, little uh, video that, uh, that you skipped out on work for uh, and was on the six o'clock news, did your bosses see that? Yeah, so <laughs> it got really, really awkward because about every other week we had to do an interview and I think uh, our bosses thought we were dying uh, you know, it's like, it's like somebody's taking many, many doctor's visits. Like you're kind of like a little too polite to ask what's going on. Um, and then what happened is when the, then the Ellen segment aired, you know, that was the biggest one by a mile that we had ever had. And we knew that walking into the office the next day was going to be a, a rough day. Uh, luckily we had some very understanding people around, uh, but the first thing said was, hey, can I see you in my office? And when the door shut, I was terrified. Brian and I both shared our own stories um, and, and we both thought we were gonna get fired. And, the, and, and, and Brian's boss was the funniest. He goes, so I saw the segment yesterday. Uh, congratulations, uh, but I'm gonna have to revoke a lot of your paid time off. And, you know, we, we worked out some deals. We still do some residual work outside of Two Blind Brothers. Um, we've worked out some really nice um, uh, deals with, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our former companies at some level. And um, it, it wasn't as bad as we thought it would be. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, from anyone else, we had one question earlier that had come up. Uh, Brad, and it was about uh, orientation and mobility uh, skills and, and training. Do you guys uh, use white canes or uh, identification canes or any of that stuff? We don't. You know, one of the things about Stargardt's disease is uh, for all, not, not all Stargardt's people, but, um, but for us, uh, you know, we've been lucky to keep a lot of our peripheral vision, which is, yeah. you know, which is, um, you know, more important for mobility than center vision, sort of the opposite of a disease like retinitis pigmentosa. We have met um, a number of Stargardt's people um, who do, um, but they generally use it as, um, you know, to identify themselves, especially if they're in a new environment. Um, so you know, Brian and I don't use them. Some people with our condition have them, um, but, uh, but Brian and I do not. Excellent. Anyone else? 
Somebody just uh, posted on the uh, on the chat that they uh, love the uh, the comment that you made. Most of the challenges in our lives unlock our potential. She said, "Love that." Unfortunately, it is like the truest thing in the world. You know, if you want to get better at something, you know, you have to put yourself outside of your 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 comfort zone. You know, and, and even in small ways, we see that every single day. When Brian and I had to do our first interview for Two Blind Brothers, I was shaking in my boots. I was terrified. You know, we didn't know what we were going to say. We were worried about how it was going to come across on camera. And there is nothing you could have said to me to make it better. The only thing that made it easier was literally doing it another 10 times. And, and that's what really what, what's helped us um, a lot. And we really encourage that for anybody and anybody, vision impairment or, or elsewise, you know, you're going to learn so much about yourself if you put yourself outside of that, that comfort zone. Our brains are very lazy about wanting to learn new things and it, they kind of need to be put through some discomfort to get there. You know, obviously, you know, nothing that is going to um, have a permanent, uh, that failure doesn't affect you in a permanent way, but, but it's so, so, it's so true. And, and usually most people can think of an example of something where, you know, one of the, the harder things that they had to do actually ended up teaching them their, their greatest uh, skills. Right, right. Uh, we've got a, uh, a, a comment that Angela made. I was going to, uh, to say to you that uh, we uh, hosted the Canadian Vision Teachers uh, Conference here in Alberta uh, last May and uh, Molly Burke was one of our keynote speakers and, and Angela says we exported Molly Burke to you guys. Oh yeah, yeah. Now she's a big LA superstar, and that, she was in the right. YouTube. She was in the YouTube Rewind video. I mean, we. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's that's funny. It's a small world, you know. It's a small world, but you know, I, I I like to I like to look at somebody like Molly as an example of a few things. You know, are are all of us able to be you know multi million subscriber YouTube channels? No. And do we want to be it? Probably not. But I think her success is an example of how different the world is than it was 20 years ago, where you know that wasn't a realistic career. Um, you know, and, and technology has allowed her to level the playing field to to find the thing that she was good at and, and, and sort of double down on it. I mean, one anecdote that Brian didn't get to share is. You know, I worked originally at an investment bank and I was horrible at my job because it was so Excel intensive and, and it wasn't that I couldn't do it, but I was so much slower than um, a lot of the other people I worked with. And, you know, I did my best to find the areas of the job where I could, you know, leverage my strengths. But my brother kind of saw that, saw how I was having trouble there and immediately decided that he wanted to go into something where he could leverage his interpersonal uh, skills uh, better. And he went into sales, selling software to, uh, to uh, banks and credit unions at this company, uh, at first at Oracle and then at a company called SNL Financial. And he was literally the best, um, the, the top sales guy out of a class of 400 people his first year. And it, it, and it just underscores that you, you know, you really got to try a lot of different things to find out where your strengths are because just because you struggle with one thing doesn't mean you're going to struggle with everything. And we all have those things that we're better at than most. Yeah, for sure. Well, Brad, we are uh, coming right up to the end of our hour. We've got one more question here. Angela asked uh, uh, that uh, she tried shopping um, uh, during Black uh, Friday sales and apparently you guys don't ship to Canada. Any plans to change that? Oh man, I am, you know, Angela, you gotta, you gotta hit up. So here's the problem with shipping to Canada, not to make this the penultimate question of the talk, but it's usually not a pleasant experience for the customers because one, they got to pay uh, expensive shipping. And then number two, oftentimes they'll get hit with this 5% to 15% tax when it arrives. So what we have to do is we actually got to start manufacturing and set up a distribution channel in Canada to solve that problem. 
Um, but that, that's, that's the reason we've turned it off is because people weren't having a good experience with the shipping and the duties on it. Well, we're going to be uh, coming to New York with our grandson to see uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child in the upcoming months. So I can, I can, you know, collect all of the orders and go down to the Perfect. store. And bring I will back. have a I will have a suit. I will have several suitcases ready for you. And as long as you can fulfill out of your garage, then it'll be uh, it'll be perfect. Perfect. Well, with that, uh, Brad, I'm going to say thank you very much for taking the hour. This was awesome. There are all kinds of comments in the uh, in the chat here about how much folks uh, enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, and all the best uh, to you and Brian as you guys continue on your path. You know, and I, and I want to end it by thanking you guys. I want to first of all thank you for thinking of us and inviting us. You know, the, the, the magic of the success of the clothing brand is only because of the community in this space. I mean, there's 11, there's at least 11 million people in the U.S. that have, you know, a, a retinal eye disease and a lot of people who know somebody like that. And, and I'm sure the numbers are similar um, in Canada as well. And, and you know, basically this community uh, has lifted us up and it's put us in a position to meet interesting people, to enact a mission that we care about. And it's been one of the most rewarding experiences of our lives. And to, you know, to the students, I would say, you know, leverage your resources, challenge yourself, try as many things as you can to find out what works for you. For the teachers, I want to thank you personally for the craft that you've decided to dedicate yourself to. It made an incredible impact on my brother and I, and you have an enormous effect on, on, on what it does for a young person to have that guidance. And uh, we're, just, we're, we're just really grateful, and we're here for you guys. If you ever need to get in touch with us or you ever want to talk, email us. Um, it's hello at twoblindbrothers.com. And just and mention, you know, we, our, the customer service team is right here in our office, and you can reach us. Uh, you can you can reach us anytime for anything you, that you guys need. If we can be helpful. Fantastic. And with that, I will thank you again and wish you a merry Christmas. And the same to uh, to everyone who's on the webinar today. Take care, everyone. Good night. Yeah, and if, you, and if you ever run into my brother again, give him a hard time for bailing on this. Uh, it, it was probably our, we had an emergency call with our production facility um, that I think was supposed to come in later. But if you ever encounter Brian, just make sure to tell him that, uh, that I'm way better than him for closing this out and, and he should have he uh, stayed. <laughs> I was wondering if maybe that was a distributor, a potential distributor from Canada calling. I wish it was. I, <laughs> I, I wish it was. Uh, we have... Uh, 13,000 um, inquiries in our customer service inbox right now. So it, it could have been one of many, wow. probably, probably a problem and not, uh, and not necessarily a, a good message just because everybody wants their orders by Christmas. But, um, right. but we, yeah, but we really appreciate you guys. We want to thank you again and, and uh, please stay in touch. You bet. Take care. Bye now. Take care.